Theoretical frameworks are really useful when you're looking at learning design and the role of educational technologies within learning design. And the model I'm going to look at today was written by Grania Knoll, Martin Dyke, Martin Oliver and Jane Seal in 2004. And this framework presents six modes of learning. And these could be seen on a scale, but to begin with, let's just look at them individually. First of all, an individual approach to learning. So where the focus of the learning is on the individual. Social, so that's learning through interactions with others. Non-reflection, that's focusing on memorization and functional development. Reflection, so conscious reflection of experience or understanding, I suppose, leading to, towards learning. Information, this might be material or existing knowledge that's out there, and that forms the basis of the learning. And experience, so doing something is the basis for learning. And these six modes of learning can be used to look at both pedagogies and activities. And in the examples presented by Canole and colleagues, they start with an example from behaviorism, as described by Tennant. Where behaviorism is about individualized learning, it's based on stimulus and response, it's about reinforcement and association. And quite clearly, we can say then that that's individual, non reflection, and information based learning. Not a lot of emphasis there on experience, not a lot of emphasis on being reflective, and certainly it's a more individualized approach, less about learning with others. In contrast, communities of practice as a pedagogical framework from Wenger back in 1998, that's all about mutual engagement, negotiated definitions of what the community is, shared artifacts of learning and a history of practice that bring that community together. So that is much more on the social experience, reflective side, but also there's an element of information in there as well. You're looking at artifacts and things about that, that community that, that bring them together. But what you can also do with these six modes of learning is put them onto axes where you're going from individual to social, non-reflection to reflection, information to experience. And Canole and colleagues presented this in a 3D axis and also as an octahedron. But I just like to present this quite simply as three lines that you can map a learning activity onto. In their paper, Canole and colleagues suggested that you can use this framework at different levels of learning design granularity, from mini learning activities such as tasks to full sessions, modules, or even program design. And here are a couple of examples that Canole and colleagues provided in their paper, starting with a seminar. And although they didn't specifically talk about an online or a face-to-face -face seminar, we're assuming here this is a synchronous seminar. So here we have the seminar as a social learning experience, the idea that you're learning from others' perceptions of whatever you're studying. It's largely non-reflective in the synchronous seminar space itself because everything is going at the same time. You don't have the time to pause and reflect uh, and look at your understanding. You're trying to really engage within the conversation as much as you can. So it's not as reflective as you might orig originally sort of conceive it to be, but it is more of an experiential learning approach than information giving. You're not just reading the paper and taking it, that that's the facts. There is an element here of learning through that discussion with others and learning through that experience of unpicking whatever concept is being discussed in the seminar. So in the second example, Canole and colleagues presented an online discussion and this I'm treating as asynchronous online discussion, different from a Zoom or an MS Teams meeting. But here they've shifted the axis slightly towards the individual, perhaps reflecting that it's less of an opportunity for learners to talk to each other in a very immediate sense, you're very much dependent upon what learners contribute to the space. And facilitation probably comes into play here as well. In a synchronous environment, facilitation could be much more directed. In an asynchronous environment, facilitation is a prompt um, rather than actual uh, immediate challenge that you can get in the same degree you can get in a synchronous way. So that might explain some of the shift. But then also it could be more reflective. There's more time there for learners to take a step back, read the detail of the contributions that other learners are providing, read the detail of the stimulus material, reflect on how their thinking is changing. So that could be a, 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 an easy difference there between a seminar space and an online discussion, a synchronous and an asynchronous. And then you can start thinking about, well, if they're the learn, typical learning 
characteristics of those types of activities or how can my technology support that. So I'm just going to change things up a little bit here looking at a lab practical. This wasn't one of the examples that Canole had in the, in the paper but this might be just a little example where you can just shift how you use the framework slightly to change your design for the learning. So in a lab practical you might have an individual in a physical environment conducting a lab practical on their own. It might not be very re reflective because they're trying to just keep up with the pace of the of the lab experiment and it is a mix between information and experience. They might have some stimulus material that's guiding them through this lab practical but they're also learning from doing. They're actually learning from engaging with that practical experiment. That same task though you could change the design slightly. You could make it much more social. You could have learners working together or as a group or as a team making it into a team project. You could allow time for reflection by blending the learning activity. So taking it not just in the physical space but maybe involving some digital space as well. Allowing some time after the lab practical to write up and reflect and improve the practical. You might also have an opportunity there to have learners pool their results together and again that's a more social experience. It's drawing upon others learning and others uh, results and maybe coming up with a joint conclusion based upon those results. So even the same task, a lab practical, can be framed differently by adjusting how you're going to use those different modes of learning. In their paper Canole and colleagues also suggested you can use this framework at different levels of learning design granularity. So what we mean by that is where you're design designing a small task or a mini activity through to a substantive activity, through to a session, through to a module or even a program. So there are some examples at the activity level but when you look at the broadest level then the link between overall pedagogy and program pedagogy with the framework such as this becomes clearer. So for example a program takes a particularly social learning approach or more perhaps an individualized study approach that could be reflected using this framework at a program level. At this level then you can consider the type of learning technologies that provide the program's learning environment such as the type of VLE or learning platform for resource provision, interaction and assessment. For example a professional learning program will place emphasis on experiential learning and therefore the key educational technology to support this might be an online portfolio or digital diary. So using this framework to say well what are we trying to achieve with the program as, as a whole can then inform the key technologies at the program level that could then be embedded at the modular level as well. As well as a design age this framework can be useful as a diagnostic tool so to analyze previous learning designs where educational technologies have been used effectively or not and using frameworks to map what is going on in a learning design particularly from the view of the learner can also identify over-engineered designs where learners are continually having to relearn how to learn how to engage with the course itself because they're basically getting different pedagogies um, multiple times over the course of the module or the program, different types of activities which are requiring different skill sets or even different types of educational technology. So this is one of the reasons I like to use frameworks such as this because it helps you to take a step back and ensure that there's a coherent learning journey looking at both the activity, module and program pedagogy and the way that educational technologies support that.